Hi, everybody, and uh, welcome uh, to uh, what's my first virtual hang um, and one of Village Preservation's first programs uh, that is being done exclusively virtually. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I hope everybody's doing well um, and um, staying safe and staying healthy, and that the same is true for uh, your loved ones as well. Um, like for everybody, this has been a time of adjustment for us. Uh, we're learning how to do all of this stuff uh, in the new virtual reality that we're uh, living so much of our lives in. Um, and uh, as I said before, since this is my first time doing one of these, forgive me if there might be a couple of uh, technical glitches, but hopefully it'll be worthwhile and um, hopefully we will all be able to uh, get something out of it and uh, enjoy it. And so um, the purpose for today's uh, uh, event is to just kind of update you all a little bit on what's happening with village preservation, um, as well as with the issues that we deal with. Um, and um, there's a few different ways we're gonna do that. Um, I also wanna share with you some great resources that we have that are available for you to Use. We're all spending a lot more time at home these days uh, than we're probably used to. And there's a lot of great things that you can do, um, certainly through our resources and website uh, to kind of keep you busy and uh, occupied and interested and um, connected uh, during this time. So we hope you'll take advantage of that. Um, I also want to just mention for anybody who's on the call uh, uh, who's not uh, familiar with Village Preservation, we're a nonprofit 501c3. We've been around since 1980, and our mission is to um, document, celebrate, and preserve and protect the special architectural and cultural heritage of Greenwich Village, the East Village, and NoHo. And we do that through a variety of means, everything from advocacy to try to save endangered buildings or gain landmark protections for uh, buildings or parts of our neighborhood that we think are worthy of such protections, um, fighting against what we think are uh, bad development proposals for the neighborhood, um, and a lot of uh, programming, uh, creation of resources, tours, lectures, um, et cetera. Uh, and of course, now we're doing a lot more of that uh, than ever in the, in the virtual world and online. Um, at the end of, towards the end of today's program, which I'm thinking is probably gonna be about 45 minutes into this, I'm gonna um, take and respond to questions. So you can submit questions via the chat function um, and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Um, so you can feel free to start sending those at any point. Um, and um, uh, once I'm done going through everything, um, I'll take a look at those and you may wanna um, uh, wait till towards the end because there may be things that I bring up that spark some questions. But if you have some that you know out of the gate, you're gonna wanna ask anyway, feel free to start sending those uh, in. So, uh, to start, I am going to uh, bring up some, hopefully bring up some helpful information. Oh, that's not it. Okay. Hmm. All right, give me a second here. Sorry about this, guys. This is one of the sort of technical things that I mentioned might be a little bit of a challenge. Here we go. All right, sorry about that. So, so first of all, I wanna mention that uh, because of the, um, uh, because of the pause um, that uh, the state uh, and city have put in place, a lot of our typical land use actions um, and processes have been on hold. However, they are starting up again. Um, and as you may have seen from the newsletter we sent out today, um, we're actually um, starting to have our very first um, hearings of the Landmarks Preservation Commission coming up next week, as well as some hearings of the community board, um, which will uh, 
uh, begin to take place all virtually. Um, so now those processes are happening again. And as always, we are monitoring and participating in them um, and giving you the public information about what's happening um, and how you can participate what the applications are uh, and things of that nature. Um, the city council is also beginning to have uh, meetings again. And so we um, are monitoring that because we actually have some big issues that we expect to come before the city council. In fact, they probably would have come to the city council by this point in time had it not been for the pause. Um, and that includes the proposed air rights transfer uh, for three St. Mark's place. Um, as well as the proposed um, hotel special permit requirement for the area south of Union Square, which we've been kind of pushing back on as uh, woefully insufficient um, in terms of offering the protections that areas like Greenwich Village and the East Village um, in that uh, endangered area south of Union Square really need. Um, so we're using this to push for much stronger protections for that area. Uh, and as soon as that's been scheduled at the city council, should it be, um, we will let everybody know and we're assuming those are going to be virtual meetings and we'll let you know how you can uh, participate in that again. So uh, during this time period, we're of course all working from uh, home um, uh, and remotely, um, but we're also converting a lot of the work that we do into um, uh, to make it available uh, remotely to everyone else uh, as well. And I want to talk about uh, what some of those things are. So let me bring this up here. We're going to go to, and by the way, I also want to show you how you can uh, use our website. So of course, we're at gbshp.org. And then if you either just go to gbshp.org slash events, or you click on events, you can see um, there's a lot of really, really great stuff here. So first of all, our spring house tour benefit, which actually would have been in about two weeks, um, has been postponed. We're hoping to do that in the fall. Um, uh, we'll see what conditions are like in the fall, whether or not we can do that, or if we have to do a, a different version of it or just reconsider it. But for now, it is uh, postponed and it's being uh, planned for early October. Uh, right now, we are in the thick of going through the process of uh, selecting our uh, village awardees, uh, which we, of course, do once a year, um, where we select six or seven great local businesses, institutions, people, uh, parks, um, uh, renovations um, that we uh, choose to, uh, in the course of this year, um, to honor. We typically have a, a big uh, ceremony that's part of our annual meeting in June, where about 500 of our closest friends get together and we, among other things, um, fet and celebrate these uh, uh, wonderful uh, and deserving awardees. Um, we don't expect that we're going to be able to have uh, everybody together in one room for it, uh, but we do anticipate doing our village awards this year around the usual time in June. Um, and we're uh, probably going to do that virtually uh, as well. Um, so stay tuned uh, for more information about that. But uh, we, we received uh, scores of great nominations from people um, for awardees this year. Of course, in a lot of ways, it's a particularly um, tough year um, and a particularly um, uh, there's a lot of uh, businesses and institutions that are hurting um, and for whom the support and uh, calling attention to what they do, uh, what they've provided, uh, what they do for the community, we think is particularly important. So we didn't want to just postpone or cancel the Village Awards. We wanted to have them in whatever form we could have. Um, and we're obviously being particularly mindful about which... Um, uh, what conditions are for uh, particular nominees, um, the work that they've been doing, um, and our desire to make sure that they're able to come back um, and hopefully continue to be part of the community. Uh, 
Um, we are also for the first time this year um, turning our continuing ed classes, which we typically do twice a year, um, into virtual programming. Um, so uh, with the approval of the state, uh, people who want to take continuing ed classes with us will be able to do that online um, and they will uh, be available um, at a reduced rate for people who are interested in taking them um, really just for your own enrichment as opposed to for the class credit. Um, in the past, we uh, really didn't typically open it up to the general public because we had limitations in terms of uh, the space that we used. Now that we're doing it virtually, we can have many, many more par people participate. So both for the real estate professionals who need to do this in order to uh, get their continuing education credit, as well as for the general public that's just interested in learning more about historic preservation, the New York City landmarks law, um, the development of various architectural styles in our uh, city, the evolution of uh, housing and zoning laws, um, the continuing education program is a great, great way to do that. And, uh, you know, as with everything we've been discussing here, it's just on the events page. And uh, if you look here, this is a, a class schedule. So you can see what some of the um, lectures we're going to be having um, uh, this May. Um, as part of our uh, virtual continuing education program. Usually we do it over the course of three days. Um, this time we're stretching it out to five days. Um, so if you are interested in that, um, please just um, uh, register um, and uh, we will be able to um, have you participate, which we would love to do. So let me go over to here. Um, and we are still planning to, ha we have uh, some great programs coming up. Obviously we're in the middle of one of them right now, the virtual hangout. Um, we uh, uh, next week have a uh, great book talk um, about the uh, uh, Blackwell sisters, Elizabeth and Emily Blackwell. Um, uh, Elizabeth Blackwell was the first woman doctor in America. Um, and she, along with her sister and some other women, um, set up the very first um, uh, hospital and infirmary run by and for women, as well as the first medical school uh, by and for women. Um, and uh, both of these uh, uh, existed in our neighborhoods. Um, so it's a wonderful piece of our neighborhood's history. Um, and that's going to be um, on Wednesday, April 22nd. Um, and then the following week on uh, Monday, April 27th, um, Sarah Bean Atman, who's our Director of Research and Preservation, is going to walk you through how you can do research from home um, on your building or on any other building. There's amazing resources available out there um, that you can uh, look at. So things that you've been curious about before but maybe never really had the time to um, explore or research, um, now's a perfect time to do that. And Sarah is the expert to walk you through um, how you can do that. Um, so uh, I also want to mention that if you, again, on our events page, just click to past programs, um, what you'll find is ev basically every program we've done for the last dozen or so years. Um, and uh, in many cases, we have video of the program. As you can see here, this symbol indicates video uh, is available of the program. So if there was a program that you missed, or even if there's a program that you didn't know about, but you want to uh, look online, we literally have hundreds of programs, lectures, book talks, panel discussions, um, et cetera, that you can watch the videos of, again, through our past programs page uh, on our events page, or go to our YouTube page, which is where they all exist. That's youtube.com slash GBSHP. Um, and uh, that can definitely keep you entertained for hours. Just uh, uh, earlier this year, our uh, Women of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire, you can see here this uh, symbol indicates we have video for that. Um, uh, a little bit earlier in March when we had the Andy Statman Trio playing at the museum at Eldred Street, they're incredible musicians. And of course the museum at Eldred Street is just one of the most uh, amazing and remarkable spaces uh, in New York. Um, Bricks and Brownstones, uh, our book talk about the re-release of that, um, uh, that uh, classic 
tome about the New York City row house. And, you know, you can jump back easily 10 years in time um, and uh, look at uh, programs from uh, much, much further back. Um, and uh, that will, um, uh, you can see uh, just a whole wonderful array of programming um, that uh, we've done over the last several years. Um, so these are all great resources under our events page that you can take in. And we are still planning on um, unveiling our latest historic plaque. Um, we have our historic plaque program here in June. Um, and that's going to be on the home of uh, Jane Jacobs in the West Village. Um, we are hoping that by June, um, we will be able to do that. We may not be able to have the big gathering of people all together outside that we uh, typically have. Uh, we'll see what conditions are like in June. We're hoping we'll at least be able to have the, pack, the plaque uh, placed on the house um, and have a virtual ceremony that people can safely participate in from afar. Um, so that's definitely something to uh, look forward to um, uh, and that we think uh, should be wonderful. Um, so let me also mention some other great resources that we have available to you, including some wonderful new stuff. Um, and actually, let me, before I even get to the resources, so as you may have seen, uh, one of the things in the blast email we sent out today, one of the things that we're spending a lot of time on uh, during this period is the research and documentation that really powers our push for landmark protections especially for endangered uh, parts of our neighborhoods. So um, as I mentioned before, we're focusing a lot these days on the area south of Union Square, uh, because somewhat uniquely for Greenwich Village and the East Village, it has neither landmark protections nor good zoning protections. Um, and it's facing an incredible amount of pressure right now from the um, uh, sort of tech boom in the area, as well as from the um, tech hub uh, that was approved by the city council and pushed by the mayor um, a couple of years ago that's being built on 14th Street. Um, so this is an area that really, really needs the attention. And as we shared this morning, we recently submitted um, a very, very detailed and very, very interesting history of number 86 University Place, one of the buildings in the district, which is, um, again, all this information is accessible through our website. And in doing the research, we were just amazed to discover, first of all, one of the first residents of the building was a, a, a gentleman named Benjamin Hazard Field, who was this incredible um, uh, philanthropist who was uh, responsible largely for the foundation of the uh, American Museum of Natural History, um, he was uh, uh, in many ways responsible for uh, the uh, New York Public Library system taking the current form. He was a prime mover behind what was called the New York Free Circulating Library, which was sort of one of the three legs of the original New York Public Library system. He helped found the very first uh, library for women in New York, um, the very first hospital in the country. Um, for people suffering from chronic diseases, um, the New York uh, Historical Society. Um, so, and that's really just the beginning. Uh, then from there, um, the home, uh, um, some really interesting uh, German immigrant business people um, had used 86 uh, University Place as both their home and their business headquarters. Um, this kind of tells you a lot about the immigrant experience in New York in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And then into the early 20th century, a very colorful gentleman, gentleman uh, Barney Gallant, who was known as the mayor of Greenwich Village. Um, he was the first person um, in New York to be prosecuted under the Volstead Act or prohibition. Um, he, uh, he had uh, a very, very well-known establishment there called the Royalist. Um, and then starting in the 1950s, um, the building was the home of the Bagatelle, which became one of the most prominent lesbian bars in New York during that time. And what's interesting about it is it was uh, particularly uh, popular among uh, several women who became prominent writers, Audre Lorde among them, as well as Ann Bannon. And we have all of that uh, information in here. Um, you can also take a look at uh, another um, 
a very detailed piece of documentation we recently submitted to the Landmarks Preservation Commission about this same area, the corridor south of, uh, of Fifth Avenue, south of Union Square, which is uh, between uh, 12th Street and 14th Street, largely unlandmarked, uh, but has some incredibly rich history. Um, it really, really, really makes for a fascinating read. Um, everything from political radicals to um, great uh, uh, writers uh, and artists. Um, the recording studio where Billie Holiday did her first recordings and where arguably uh, racial integration and in recorded music began. Um, uh, figures like uh, the, the Roosevelt family, Andrew Carnegie, um, connected to um, some of these buildings. Um, really, really an incredible history. The Sacco and Vanzetti trial, um, the women's peace movement in the early 20th century, um, all connected to these buildings. Um, the um, fight to call attention to and to stop the Armenian genocide um, headquartered in this in buildings in this corridor of Lower Fifth Avenue. Um, so it really makes for a great read. Um, interestingly, the National Board of Review of Motion Pictures was also located here for many years. And this was the entity which more or less got to decide um, what movies the public did or didn't see. Um, so there's really some pretty varied and incredible history um, connected to these buildings. So definitely um, check that out. And uh, introducing our new podcast. So uh, today we've announced uh, the introduction of, uh, of another great way we have to connect to the public, which is our podcast. And I'm gonna now bring you to our resources page. So if you go from our uh, homepage, um, which I'm going to bring you back to here, and you click on resources. You can also just go to gbshp.org slash resources, and it'll take you there. There's a lot, a lot of stuff in here that you can uh, check out. Um, let me refresh this so that, here we go. So on the list, you'll see it says podcast off the grid. We have a new podcast on SoundCloud called- Have you ever heard about the trailblazing metal? Sorry about that. Um, so we have two episodes that we've just um, uh, started with. One of them happens to be about the Blackwell sisters as well, as well as a, another groundbreaking doctor named Rebecca Cole, who worked with them, who was the second African-American uh, uh, female doctor ever. Um, and again, all this work took place in our neighborhoods. Um, and uh, the second one that we have is called Favorite Clubs of Greenwich Village. Uh, and the East Village, and we take a look at three historic clubs, one of which is still around in Greenwich Village and the East Village that had a really, really prominent role in relation to um, African-American history, to LGBT uh, history, um, as well as to some of the great uh, musical performers of the late 20th century. So definitely check out our blog. Um, uh, and as I said, if you just go to our resources page, um, you'll find that there. And that's one of the new uh, resources that we've just introduced um, to the public today. So hot off the presses. Um, we've also got some other great stuff that uh, we've had for a while, but is particularly uh, useful, I think, during this time period. One of them is our historic image archive, uh, which uh, again, on our resources page, you can just access it here, but I already have it open. Um, we have about 2000 images here. Um, uh, that uh, span from uh, the late 19th century, we've actually got some sort of drawings and etchings, um, to the early 21st century. They're in 39 different collections, so you can browse either by collection, which will tell you a little bit about um, what they are. It usually has to do with sort of the source. Um, uh, but you can also explore, and you might find it in some ways even more useful to search by map. So if you want to find what sort of historic images we have for a specific area, um, you can look at our map and if you click here, um, excuse me, it'll make it full screen um, and uh, you can explore that way. Of course, I'm going a little slow here, but uh, you can see it on here. It looks like it's now up. Yeah, there we go. So you just close in a little bit and just click wherever you're interested in 
seeing some images. And by the way, they extend across the five boroughs, although by far the majority of them are concentrated in the area um, of Greenwich Village, East Village, Lower East Side, et cetera. So uh, this will show you the image and then you can just click on it and it'll bring you to the uh, image. This looks like it's from the mid 20th century. Um, you can see First Presbyterian Church here. Um, but there's literally, um, as I said, 2000 of these images. Um, they're really um, pretty incredible. Um, we've got some great ones from, uh, a lot of these were donated. Uh, this is a woman who lives in the East Village who was a location scout named uh, Meredith Jacobson Marciano. Um, pictures that she took largely in the latter part of the 20th century. Um, let's see, what are some other great ones here? Um, I, these are by Fred uh, W. McDara, who was the um, uh, photographer for the Village Voice for many years. So we've got uh, Jimi Hendrix sitting at the console at uh, Electric Lady Studio uh, before it was even opened. Um, this wonderful image here of uh, the Jefferson Market uh, Courthouse at the time of the picture, now library, um, and Patchen Place, um, just to give some examples. Um, Jack Kerouac reading on the road in this sort of Christ-like pose um, at the artist's studio on East 3rd Street um, in 1959. Um, so there's really a, a just an incredible, incredible array of uh, images here to choose from. And a lot of them are available for sale or prints, I should say, of the images um, are available for sale and the proceeds support our work. So definitely um, consider that uh, and check them out. Um, uh, and uh, you can reach them by just going to um, archive dot gbshp.org or again as with sort of everything else that we're going through here you can just go through the resources page of our website um, and you'll find it there so sp speaking of the resources page of our website we've got a couple of other great things on here that um, uh, i wanted to show you um, one is uh, you can get to it through here, but I'm going to show you how to get there directly. If you go to www.gbshp.org slash gbhd50 tour, it's on our resources page as well, but here's a way of getting to it directly. Um, the internet's being a little slow. Hopefully it'll take us there. But we have this, uh, the reason why it's called GBHD50 is we have a, um, uh, oh, last year we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the Greenwich Village Historic District and um, uh, we created this wonderful map um, that shows every building in the Greenwich Village Historic District um, as it looked in uh, the 1960s uh, when uh, the um, uh, uh, just before the district was landmarked um, and then we took pictures again today um, uh, 50 years later, um, in 1989, uh, I'm sorry, 2019, and we um, uh, uh, put them side by side so you could see how the um, how the uh, images had um, how the buildings have changed or not changed um, during that time. So I um, apologize that I'm having a little trouble pulling that one up there. Um, but uh, again, if you go through our resources page or you just go through, here we go. Now it seems to be working, hopefully. Yeah, now it's coming up. Um, if you go through, here we are, our um, uh, resources page or you go to gbshp.org slash gbhd50 tour. So here's what you're gonna see. We have it divided up uh, geographically, but you're gonna see these um, uh, then and now pictures of uh, basically every one of the 2,200 buildings in the Greenwich Village Historic District. And then we have a series of about 27 tours um, of the neighborhood, which among them have about a thousand different um, historic sites in them. Um, and we give you the background on them. So for instance, we have an immigration landmarks tour 
Uh, one of them is the home of Emma Lazarus, the author of The New Colossus, um, the, the poem that's on the uh, Statue of Liberty. Uh, let's see, what else do we have in here? Um, uh, the White Horse Tavern certainly relates to immigration history in terms of the history of Irish immigrants um, in the neighborhood. In each case, there'll be a 1969-ish uh, um, uh, um, and 2019 uh, picture. Uh, Greenwich House, which was of course uh, established to um, uh, help and assist um, immigrants uh, in the neighborhood in the early uh, 20th century and some remarkable people came out of there um, and some remarkable social reforms and innovations started there that were then um, uh, transposed citywide. Um, we have a tour of uh, where the course of history was changed at, at various locations throughout Greenwich Village. Uh, the first racially integrated nightclub in New York, in the, uh, I'm sorry, in America, um, the Stonewall Riots, the birthplace of the modern LGBT movement, um, the place where the Manhattan Street Grid was born, um, the first museum dedicated to contemporary American art, um, the first course in African American studies, um, Jane Jacobs' home, speaking of which, and the great urban uh, paradigm shift, um, and speaking of great women, we have our tour of transformative women um, uh, and showing where they lived. Um, political figures like Bella Abzug, um, photographers Bernice Abbott, um, writers like Louise Bryant, um, activists like Crystal Eastman, um, really just incredible Edna St. Vincent Millay. Um, and if you click over here, you'll see all of the rest of the tours. So it's everything from architecture. So we have a uh, kind of our selection of the most, some of the most charming spots um, uh, in Greenwich Village um, to um, things like uh, Edward Hopper's Greenwich Village, sites in the neighborhood connected to um, that great painter, um, the locations of various movie and, uh, movies and TV shows, et cetera. Um, so it's really pretty wonderful. Um, and similarly, um, if you just go to gbshp.org, slash civil rights map. We have this uh, incredible map with uh, about 200 entries on it um, showing the civil locations connected to important moments in civil right history throughout the East Village uh, and Greenwich Village um, and NoHo. Um, we have African American history, as you can see, we've got about 40 different sites here. You know, everything from uh, uh, Alex Haley's uh, studio where uh, uh, the writer of Roots lived and where he uh, conducted the interviews that became the autobiography of Malcolm X, the Freedman Savings Bank, um, uh, Howard Bennett uh, residence. He's the man who successfully led the drive to create the um, Martin Luther King holiday. Um, lots of incredible stuff. Lorraine Hansberry, the NAACP headquarters. We've certainly got many, many sites in the neighborhood connected to LGBT history um, and civil rights. Uh, sites connected to um, the women's movement, um, whether it's prominent people or important events that took place here, um, and our social justice and other civil rights um, uh, uh, category, sort of a kind of uh, catch-all. Um, we've also got uh, Hispanic or uh, Latino, Latina history, um, so important sites connected to that, as well as uh, a fair number of sites connected to Asian American history and Asian American civil rights that were located uh, in our neighborhood. So um, check this out as well. Um, as I said, it's a, um, uh, it's a resource we've had for a while, but it's one that we are constantly um, adding to. So um, uh, it's definitely a great way to spend some time now um, if you find yourself having a little free time uh, on your hands. So um, just a couple of other things that I wanna make sure you're uh, aware of that we're also adding to every day. Uh, one of them, of course, is our blog that we um, update daily. Um, and uh, these days, uh, typically we do it five days a week. These days we're doing it seven days a week. Um, and these are just um, uh, daily items uh, telling you about, you know, interesting history of the neighborhood, interesting characters, things that took place on that day in history, tours that we've created of uh, various things like churches of the East Village in this particular case, um, 
kind of a curated tour of our historic image archive showing uh, historic images and things that we're looking forward to doing again once the um, quarantine is over. Um, uh, for instance, whether it's playing in the fire hydrant or uh, going to the fountain at Washington Square, taking a look at some of the great landmark sites in New York outside of our neighborhood and learning how they're actually uh, deeply connected to Greenwich Village or the East Village through our Beyond the Village and Back um, uh, series on our blog, uh, looking at important uh, um, artistic figures and uh, women um, often overlooked who had such a huge impact on uh, the course of um, American history and American art. Um, some great reads uh, about Greenwich Village and the East Village during this time period. Um, so our blog is definitely being updated uh, every day um, with some great stuff. And you can, of course, get to that through our um, resources page again, or just go directly to gbshp.org uh, slash blog. So just a couple of other things I want to hit on before we uh, wrap up and go to um, that's not what I meant to hit before we go to um, uh, questions. So we also have this wonderful oral history collection, um, which you can really get lost in, um, in a good way. Um, and I would definitely recommend trying to uh, check it out during this time period. Um, you know, recently we've added some great uh, people to it. Uh, Penny Arcade, uh, Fred Bass, the recently deceased uh, um, owner of the, um, the Strand Bookstore, um, uh, George Kaminsky, uh, who's been incredibly active in affairs at West Beth for a very, very long time. Um, the great preservation architect, uh, James Polshek. Um, Chino Garcia, who's one of the founders of, uh, of Charles El Bojillo in the East Village. Um, David Rothenberg, who uh, founded the Fortune Society. Um, and we also have um, uh, uh, oral history separated by these collections. So one of them is Preservation Pioneers, um, and we have a, uh, an oral history with Jane Jacobs from uh, the late 1990s, um, where she, you know, you get to hear her in her own voice talking about how she did what she did and what, uh, what these campaigns were like and what she was up against, um, really some pretty incredible stuff. Um, so uh, it's definitely worth exploring and checking out. We've got a lot of, um, uh, owners of some great uh, um, cherished local businesses, which I think now more than ever we're conscious of. So uh, Ola and Fozzi are the longtime owners now of the B&H Dairy uh, in the East Village. We also, among others, have uh, Matt Yumanov, who was the owner for a long time of the um, uh, Yumanov Guitars. Um, we have uh, Maria Kenny from Kenny's Castaways, which is also uh, kind of no longer with us. Uh, Romana and Andrew Raffetto of Raffetto's. Um, we have um, uh, Peter Longo from Puerto Rico um, uh, Coffee, um, which is located in both Greenwich Village and the East Village. And you know they tell you the stories of their their families, their businesses. Um, uh, we have the uh, current owner of Vinny Arrows. Um, so really, really some incredible stories that are uh, very much worth checking out. And I think the last thing that I'm going to show you, which is also um, accessible through our resources page, um, but I'm going to show you how you can get there directly as well, is our East Village Building Blocks page. So if you just go to gbshp.org slash building blocks. Make sure you spell it right. There you go. Um, and as I said, you can also get to it through our resources page. This is a, a project that was a, a labor of love for us. It took 10 years for us to put this together. Um, but it is basically the history of every single building in the entire East Village. Um, about uh, 2,300 buildings, um, along with a series of guided tours. So uh, the best way to explore it, I think, is to use the block finder. So you go to the block finder and you click on a block that's of particular interest to you. Let me take a look at uh, this one here. So this is the block bounded by St. Mark's Place, 7th Street, 1st Avenue and Avenue A. 
And then you have every building on the block. They're tagged in a variety of different ways. And if you click on it, um, so it's going to tell you when the building was built, what it was originally used for, who the original owner was, who the original architects were. It's going to tell you something about it in terms of its history, um, as well as its um, uh, in terms of its origin, as well as things that have happened since then, this happens to be the building that was used on the cover of Led Zeppelin's album, Physical Graffiti. Um, and uh, then we have um, documents that are linked in. So for instance, we have copies of the documents that show when the building was built and when it was altered and things of that nature. Um, we have uh, tax photos of the building, so buildings at various points in time. This one is from 1980. We often, the 1980 photos are unfortunately not very good, not very clear, although they still sometimes have useful information. Um, but they also, uh, on a lot of these pages, and we're adding this as we speak, we have the 1940s photos, which interestingly, even though they're much older, are generally much clearer and sharper. Um, and of course, uh, go much further back in time. And then we have uh, links to other information about um, the building. So for instance, uh, as I mentioned before, um, this particular building was used as the cover for Led Zeppelin's physical graffiti album, and we had once included that in a blog post. So here's the blog post about it with a little more detail um, and background about that. As I mentioned, there's also some great guided tours on here. Um, so uh, you just click on guided tours. I guess that took you to the first one. So let's see, how about we go to synagogues. Um, so if you click on the synagogues tour, um, it'll show you basically all of the synagogues in the East Village or that have some sort of um, synagogue connection. Some of them were originally built as churches, some of them no longer, some of them now are churches, some of them uh, function as uh, something else now. Um, but, you know, they have some really, really incredible uh, history to them and incredible architecture. This is a former synagogue now that's, the, that's now the Sixth Street Community Center. Uh, why don't we click on, uh, whoops, another uh, tour here. How about individual landmarks? So these are buildings that are individually landmarked within the East Village, which of course includes some of the most historically significant buildings um, uh, in the neighborhood. A lot of churches, a lot of synagogues, um, children's aid society buildings, Yiddish theaters, um, Webster Hall, so performance spaces, um, public bathhouses, libraries, um, and again, you just you click on it, and there's always a ton of information. Um, the Stuyvesant Fish House, um, the uh, this bank at uh, University Place, uh, not University Place Avenue C, um, the former uh, German American shooting uh, gallery um, uh, uh, located on St. Mark's Place, um, Cooper Union. So really, really just some great, great, great stuff here. Um, so uh, definitely check that out. And uh, the last thing I think I'm just gonna quickly mention is that if you go to, uh, at the very top of this page, Village Preservation Reports, uh, you're gonna see um, a couple of dozen reports that we've produced over the years um, that uh, range from everything from a catalog of every new building that was approved for, um, uh, for construction in the Greenwich Village Historic District to um, uh, things about the, I'm not sure why that's not uh, showing up better, but uh, things about the um, uh, history of, um, of various parts of our neighborhood, the Meatpacking District, uh, East Village, uh, Far West Village, um, NYU, a whole range of things there. So great stuff to sort of get lost in. So that is, um, the end of my um, presentation, so to speak. And now I need to take a look at um, some, uh, let's see, some questions. So let me see what we've got here in terms of questions. All right, let's see. All right, so sorry about this, just uh, a little bit of technical challenges here. Um, 
So, uh, all right. Okay. B by the way, if you haven't already sent in your questions, send them in. Um, but uh, I'm going to take the first one here, uh, which is what are, what are you doing and what can be done to help with, uh, to help small businesses in the neighborhood? Uh, which is a great question and one that's certainly, I think, on uh, a lot of people's minds right now. Um, I wish I could say that we were... Uh, this was a problem that we could solve ourselves, um, but uh, we're definitely trying to do everything that we can um, to uh, help our local small businesses. So we're reaching out to a lot of them. Um, we're, for those that are um, still open, we're publicizing that they're open. For those that are uh, doing online business, we're trying to share information about that. We've been gathering and collecting information about the, um, uh, um, the resources that are available to businesses at this time, whether it's from government assistance or from uh, uh, grants and some other foundation assistance uh, that's available. Um, so we, we have a, a nice network of businesses in the neighborhood and we're trying to spread the word um, to all of them um, about anything that we become aware of um, in terms of a resource. We've also heard from some of our friends um, uh, about uh, a desire to help small businesses by helping them to set up uh, fundraising campaigns and things like that. And we've been connecting small businesses to that. Um, so, you know, beyond that, I would say just for those that are open, whether it's uh, brick and mortar or virtual, patronize them, um, buy gift cards. Um, and uh, as soon as they're able to reopen, um, make sure you're, you're, you're there to support them um, because they're, uh, they're really going to need it. Um, so let's see, I have another question here that I see, which is, um, what is, let's see, so what is happening with new applications since you say that the uh, Landmarks Preservation Commission and the community boards is now having hearings again? Um, so yes, they are. Um, and as I mentioned before, and I'm going to sort of bring this back up, um, we uh, have just started to deal with, um, we're just starting to see, see these uh, meetings scheduled again. And there's uh, actually the very first one is next Monday. So, um, and that's gonna be at Community Board 4. Um, we do um, uh, cover a little bit of the area north of 14th Street in the Meatpacking District in the Gansevoort Market Historic District. And there's a landmark application um, for that, uh, for a site there that's gonna be heard at Community Board 4 on Monday. So, uh, you know, as we usually do, we send out information about the, um, uh, the applications, what's happening with them. And uh, uh, typically we say, go to this location at this time at this date, um, and you can speak or what have you. Um, that's not what's gonna happen this time. You're gonna be able to uh, sign up um, to be able to participate uh, by Zoom or by phone. So here's the location on the corner of 14th Street and 9th Avenue. Um, as you can see, the hearing um, is uh, um, going to be uh, next week, 420, uh, uh, Monday, uh, April 20th. Um, and if you go down here, um, you can take our survey while you're on the page. Um, but uh, uh, what you'll find down here, among other things, is First of all, an, uh, a description of the application, it's, it, as they describe it as, fully restore the ex exterior of the existing buildings and construct a new nine-story commercial office infill behind the restored buildings and attached to them. Um, and if you click here, um, it will pull up the actual application. Um, and so you can see what it is that they are proposing. This is the current conditions. You can see there are already several kind of large buildings there. Um, this is, they want to restore these buildings, they want to add this there. Um, so these are uh, just some examples of what uh, is going on. So um, there are a couple of items that are coming before the Landmarks Preservation Commission uh, next week. Um, and then uh, in either a week or two, we'll have uh, um, another hearing again, virtual. And for all of these applications, if they're located, located in our neighborhood, um, and by the way, the way that you get to this on our website, you might have received the blast email today, um, 
if you go to our website um, and you want to see stuff about Landmarks applications, you can click here, Landmarks applications webpage. You can also just always go to gvshp.org slash LPC, it stands for Landmarks Preservation Commission. That'll also take you there. So if you want to remember or bookmark that, um, and then this will show you all of the upcoming applications, uh, when they're going to be heard, uh, and what's uh, happening with that. Um, so we definitely want to make sure that people continue to participate in these um, and that we um, uh, stay on top of these applications that, that they don't go without public scrutiny um, just because of the uh, quarantine. So, all right, I see another question here. Uh, let's see, what are you guys doing in terms of uh, education for children? I know you were on a children's education program. Are you able to continue to do that now? Um, so yes, uh, we do run a children's education program, which we're incredibly proud of. It was the first um, uh, children's education program uh, based around historic preservation in New York City. Uh, and we've been running it for uh, 20, uh, over 20 years now. Um, and it's done uh, both in schools with kids um, uh, and um, here in the field, so to speak, the field being our neighborhood, uh, where we, uh, our educators go to the, the schools, uh, meet with the kids, um, give them sort of a, a kind of basic rundown about uh, history and historic preservation. Then in a second session, bring them to Greenwich Village or the East Village to show them some incredible examples of uh, architecture and history um, that are preserved here. And then we, um, uh, and then for the third and final session, we go um, back to the school and do an art project um, and a way of kind of cementing that knowledge for the kids. Um, obviously with the schools out of session, uh, or at least out of, uh, you know, uh, in-person session, um, we're not running our typical children's education program, but we are in the process of putting together several uh, videos um, that we've created um, for kids. Um, and uh, our normal children's education program is run exclusively through schools. So a class and a school signs up for it. These videos will be available to anybody. Um, uh, we're putting the finishing touches on it, so they're not up yet, but if you come back to our kids ed page on our website, um, you'll see them soon. And so, you know, a parent with a child um, can uh, look at them uh, and use them as well. So it'll be a great way to keep your, your children engaged um, during this time period also. Um, and that's something we're going to want to continue to do even after the quarantine is, is over um, because it's great to have those resources for uh, children at home. Um, but we are anxious to get our uh, children's education program back up and running um, because um, we reach somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500 students a year throughout all the five boroughs. Um, and we offer the program at a sliding scale. Um, basically, if you can, if a school can pay, it's a pretty nominal fee, um, just to sort of make sure that they're um, stick to the reservation that they make. Um, but if it's a school, if it's a high need school, um, uh, we charge them nothing. Um, uh, we it's either free or reduced cost, and that's you know based on um, city statistics about the number of children in the school who. Um, receive free lunches um, and the children don't pay for the program under any circumstances um, just the schools do and again it's a it's a fairly uh, modest fee um, even for those that do pay so we're really looking forward to that and we offer that to both public and private schools although by far the majority of the participants are um, public schools so we're really um, we're really happy about that um, so let's see I think we have time for one more question uh, let's see. Um, okay, uh, here's one about our historic image archive. Um, you said that your uh, images in your historic image archive are available for sale. Um, how do I do that? So let me take you to that again. Um, so if you go to resources um, and click on historic image archive. So um, not all of them are available uh, for print because some of them, there's a few that we don't own the rights to. Um, and then for those that we do sell, but most of them are available. Um, and for those that we do sell prints, um, they, uh, for the most part, there is a basic uh, price, which is for um, 
uh, an eight by 10, um, it's 64.95, and for an 11 by 14, it's 72.95. Um, however, the ones through um, that have been uh, loaned to us by the Fred McDara, um, Fred W. McDara Trust, those are a little more expensive, and those are sort of spe specifically a fundraiser um, for us. Um, and it was incredibly generous of the McDara Foundation to offer these to us. And um, so those um, you would order uh, separately, um, and it's a different pricing scale. Um, but if you have questions about any of them, um, in terms of ordering a print, just click on purchase a print. Um, this is Sam Moskowitz's email. Send him an email with the uh, URL of the image you want and the size and number of prints, and we'll tell you um, exactly what the, what the deal is or what the story is there. Um, and uh, even if you're not interested in buying a print, as I said, um, Really, it's just, it's incredibly, um, incredibly um, enjoyable to just kind of look through all of these um, uh, amazing images. Uh, Baselka a couple of years ago gave us some great old images of their buildings. Um, we've got some of some old uh, postcards of, uh, of the neighborhood, particularly uh, Cooper Square. Um, so in some cases there, uh, things like postcards or etchings. Uh, let's see, we've got some uh, images of the of the West Village and the uh, Gansevoort Market um, that we took in the 1980s, 90s, and 2000s. And uh, it's remarkable to see how much uh, things have changed uh, in that time period. Um, so there's really, really some incredibly interesting stuff. We have the wonderful um, Carol Teller um, collection, um, a wonderful East Village longtime resident uh, artist named Carol Teller who over the course of uh, 30 or 40 years took some just incredible pictures every day um, throughout walking around the neighborhood and then um, donated them to us. Um, and they're really just a remarkable record of the history of our neighborhoods. This is a uh, bocce court in the early 1960s on the corner of uh, First Avenue and First Street. Um, it's now a park. The bocce court is no longer there, but it was at the heart of what was the sort of Little Italy section of the East Village. Uh, buildings in the process of being demolished, etc. So, uh, so there we have it. Um, so thank you so much, everybody, for uh, participating. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, I hope everybody is staying safe and well, um, and I hope you'll continue to participate in our programs. Um, give us feedback. Let us know what you think we can be providing, especially during this time period that would be um, useful to you. Um, and I really uh, look forward to, in the hopefully not too distant future, being able to talk to and see all of you uh, in person uh, and not just through a computer screen. Um, so take care and we will see you soon.